Hello everyone, welcome to uh, third Diyarbakır Comparative Literature Days organized by List Publishing, Diyarbakır Art Center, uh, also by Veje Ahmed, Diyarbakır Literature House and supported by Space of Culture. Uh, thank you for being with us tonight. Uh, we are very much happy and uh, can't express our gratitude enough for our uh, precious writers from across Europe who are joining us tonight uh, in this session which we co-organized with Literature Across Frontiers based in Wales. Uh, Alexandra Bükler, uh, Director of Literature Across Frontiers, also um, a Director of European Platform for uh, Literary Exchange Trans Translation and Policy Debate. Uh, our work together is going back uh, to several years where we actually were together in the first edition of this Comparative Literature Days in Diyarbakır physically. And after several years, it's a great pleasure uh, to be together on this online uh, panel together uh, to talk about a completely new phase we have entered globally. So what we wanted to express and discuss in this session was, was uh, to share thoughts about the common ambiguities, common worries uh, concerning the future of the world and literature, in this case, European literature, with, uh, with our uh, authors who are coming from different backgrounds. So, um, I'm looking forward to our discussion and, and inviting Alexandra to uh, introduce you. Thank you very much, Ovgu, and it's a real pleasure to be um, in touch with you again. As you said, uh, we have worked uh, on a number of projects before, and um, I'd like to thank you for this invitation to uh, contribute to your festival, which you have revived and started again. Um, I want to congratulate you and your team and Lal Lalesh, the, the publisher, who is also the force behind this on, the, on setting up the new literature house in Diyarbakir. Um, as you said, I was privileged uh, to attend your first festival and I remember distinctly that um, the, uh, the moderator of the panel uh, I was on uh, introduced me as a literary activist and um, I thought at that time and I still think that it was a really fitting description because um, Literature Across Frontiers um, has a mission to make literature travel, but we're not doing that uh, simply for uh, the sake of doing it. Um, we're we're uh, working on um, really opening up dialogue between different cultures through literature and translation. And um, we hope that uh, this can um, achieve at least a degree of understanding between different cultures and different literary scenes and writers. Um, the name of your festival is Fragile Future or Fragile Futures, and we do live in extraordinary times. Uh, we, we actually live in a, in a time of a very serious global crisis, which is political, ecological, and through, um, I, I should say, disrespect for, for nature, uh, we also are now adding a, another crisis, a health crisis of the, of the global pandemic. Um, we're lucky to be able to connect like this. Um, it's, it's amazing to have this technology, but it's the same technology that has um, 
that has contributed to misunderstandings, to, uh, to, to, to twisting and manipulation, twisting of truths, of facts and manipulation of um, people's opinions. What we're going to be talking about is what role can literature play, what role writers play in today's society, how can we, um, how can we contribute to, to a debate. Um, now, I would like to thank the authors very much and uh, for agreeing to take part in the panel. And I will very briefly introduce them. Claire Azzopardi um, is in Malta, a tiny island in the middle of the Mediterranean. Um, she's an award-winning writer of books for children, young readers and adults, as well as plays and a libretto for children's opera. Um, she, um, her work has been translated into a number of languages, including Arabic, and it's important to remember that Maltese, the language she writes in, is, um, is akin to Arabic, it's another Semitic language. And um, it's the only one that um, is a European language. So it's uh, so, so Malta has this really interesting situation of bilingualism, English and Maltese. Uh, Claire is also an academic. She heads the Department of Maltese at the University of Malta Junior College. And she is an active member of Initiamed, a cultural NGO um, which has been a long-term, long-standing partner of Literature Across Frontiers, which, among other activities, um, organizes the annual Malta Mediterranean Literature Festival. Julia Fiedorczuk is in Poland. She's a poet, prose writer, translator, and lecturer in American literature at Warsaw University. She has published six collections of poetry, two collections of short stories, and two novels. Much of her work is associated with eco criticism and is often attributed for popularizing the eco poetry genre. Her latest collection of poetry, Psalms, uh, Psalmi, uh, won the Szymborska. Uh, Poetry Award, and um, it's a remarkable collection which uh, seeks to represent those without a voice, people who lost their lives in war, as well as species and ecosystems that have become irrevocably lost. But she also writes about cities, and uh, she was part of another project we have worked on um, called Metropoetica, uh, Women Writing Cities. And uh, we were working on this project with um, uh, the uh, Welsh poet Zoe Scolding, who uh, initiated it and organized it. Now, um, speaking to us from Wales, uh, UK, is Niall Griffiths. Niall has been a prominent voice in the Welsh literary scene um, since his first novel introduced him as a distinctive vernacular narrator back in the year 2000. Since then, he has published, I think it's eight novels by now, a memoir, um, uh, also another book, which is a retelling of the Welsh Mabinogi legend, one of them, and um, a book of poems. Um, one of his novels was adapted for television and another one was made into a feature film. <clears throat> his work has been translated into a number of languages and his latest novel, Broken Ghost, won this year's uh, Wales Book of the Year Award. It was his second, actually. And um, the book is praised for following in the tradition of the greatest Welsh authors like Dylan Thomas, Caradoc Evans, and Iris Thomas, and at the same time creating a, quite a new um, approach, a, a, a profane, passionate, and I'm quoting, uh, passionate response to nature and to the countryside rarely encountered in contemporary British fiction anymore. 
So these are the three writers and I will um, pass the word back to Ovgo to uh, moderate this session. Thank you, Ovgo. Thank you, Alexandra. So as much as we refer to a global crisis concerning the actual moment we're in, we also um, frequently see that this crisis is somehow accumulated in the center, central Europe in uh, different aspects um, concerning a different range of issues, including um, nationalism, migration, democracy, cultural and artistic freedom in different um, scales in different countries across Europe. And the health crisis, the recent health crisis we have been going through has again once more attracted this attention uh, to the European continent. So today, you know, holding this panel from Turkey, which in a way is described as the, at the edges of Europe, we would also want to um, open the question uh, concerning this relation between the European context and non-European contexts, how this actually affects the questions regarding the future, future of all societies, but also in today's specific context, the future of literature as well. So we are very much curious to hear your original viewpoints from your own local contexts, as well as uh, you know, your overall um, ideas concerning the world situation. So maybe that's how we may start. Um, anyone who would like to start first? Mm -hmm. I can go first. Yeah. <clears throat> um, it seems to me that the necessity of, oh. of the EU, or rather a not necessarily the EU, but a block of countries sharing cultures and sovereignty that was that was mirrored in the EU is now necessary more than ever, um, given the the rise and hege hegemony of China and Russia and America, um, and also um, up and coming uh, economies like Brazil. Um, this, these are all necessary as counterbalances, not as well as competitors, obviously, but not as participants in a in a in a, in a trade war. Or, or a cold war after which usually the hot war happens and um, this is why to me it seems to leave the eu especially on the way it was done sold as a shallow salvationist myth to mask the depredations and savageries that have been committed on on this country by the government itself not by brussels is such a shallow and dangerous way of doing things and it's made me realize well i've always known it anyway that um um, there's always been something psychotic in the in the English imperialist temperament, um, and now there's now that there's no stay with that, because Britain is leaving the EU. It's come to the fore, and it links with the whole notion of um, the collapse of shame, um, especially in Malta. It seems to me this 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 no desire to hide corruption. It's that proudly people politicians are proudly corrupt, and it seems to me we need to act together to counteract that but the more we become atomized the more difficult that is that is to do and especially with um, the ma the madman that's ruling america at the moment okay thanks for these starting uh, remarks julia would you like to maybe continue <clears throat> yes, yes. Um, well, I think Brexit was a kind of trauma. Uh, I remember, I remember that that day very clearly, uh, and I think it was a kind of trauma to all, all, all of us Europeans who are who are um, uh, somehow uh, who believe in the in the idea of this of this common Europe, which is not an obvious thing in my country either, because there is a lot of Euro so called Euro skepticism. Mm -hmm in Poland as well, which is very, which is very bad and which is, um, uh, which is being fueled by the populists who, um, and you know, I, I don't have anything really interesting to say about populism, 
like everywhere in the world, Polish populists are, are uh, using people's sense of disadvantage, are using people's um, fear, are manipulating you know, the, the, the current crisis in such a way as to convince everyone that it's, you know, uh, that it's only a, a kind of strong nationalistic power now that can help people feel safe. Yeah, so it's just tapping into these very um, uh, uh, sort of vulnerable um, emotional uh, uh, spots in people that that um, that that gains this this uh, po po terrible populist government such a such a popularity. So I guess this is happening uh, all over the place. But I've been thinking about the relationship. So so one thing is that uh, is that I think. You know the things that are happening in Europe, such as Brexit or the rise of populism in uh, Central Eastern Europe, but also in Germany, um, what we're hearing recently. So, old Europe also has the so-called old Europe, yes, or the core European Union countries are also are also in trouble. So, I think this is a kind of shock because um, because you know a while ago it seemed that European Union is relatively stable and that Europe is um, you know is this special continent um, where we can have this collaboration between countries and all of a sudden so 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 and all of a sudden so and Europeans tend to perceive themselves as uh, the center of the of the world which is of course wrong yes but this eurocentrism uh, you know i guess we all have it to to um, uh, to to some extent so i think the shock now is that the crisis actually strikes the center yes because it's not that it doesn't strike um, everybody else, but um, the fact that other countries, that other places in the world are in crisis, we have almost normalized this, yes? So like when you think about climate catastrophe in Bangladesh, it's almost like normal because, you know, it's Bangladesh and so it's supposed to be um, in trouble. Or when you hear about coronavirus in China, Okay, whatever. Yes, uh, it's it's China. So I think that the the, the when we we look towards Europe now, because um, not because there is not the, the, there is no crisis outside of Europe, because of course there is, and people are 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 suffering uh, uh, immensely, especially because of climate change, all the so-called refugee crisis. You know, as if it was our crisis, um, is about that, right? But the but the point is that this time the center is also affected by, by the world crisis. Thank you. Uh, Claire, what would you like to add? Okay. Um, allow me to, to tell you this uh, short story. So in, in 2007, 27 men were uh, in the Mediterranean seas were left um, clinging to a tuna pen for three days, three nights in winter in rough seas. And uh, European countries did nothing but discussing who should rescue them. And if they rescue them, where these 27 men um, should go, which country should take um, the men or how many um, which country should take. So uh, Malta did nothing, Italy did nothing. Um, for three days, they were debating that uh, it was our waters, it was their waters, uh, or whatsoever. Eventually, Italians did rescue the men. But this is one story, maybe with a happy ending, out of many stories with a very bad ending. You know? And uh, what has changed since then? Now, with the pandemic, in 2020, um, so almost 13 years after, we are leaving the men on uh, small vessels um, all around the, 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 the country for 40 days, 50 days. Um, uh, they, the politicians don't want them to, to give them safe, a safe home. They don't want to hospitalize them with the excuse of the pandemic. But uh, the truth is that uh, the rhetoric was always the same, no? Um, Malta is small, um, we cannot uh, have the, the immigrants here, we are over, overpopulated, we have limited resources, and, and we have always um, wasted our time, um, so to say, um, discussing who is rescuing who and how many numbers go to which country. 
white people are are dying at at sea. Um, someone someone once called it it's uh, you know this immigration from African countries is the pass the unwanted parcel, and because of this. Um, immigrants are condemned to, 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 to the margins of society, to be seen as, as outsiders, uh, um, to, to, to be just numbers. And, and, and why have we come to this? Because, first of all, I, I think that uh, um, we have always looked at this issue from a Eurocentric point of view. You know? and, we, and this means that we have never invited the immigrants on the table where policy making is, uh, policy makers make their decisions about their lives. So, so the voices of, of the immigrants are rarely or never taken into consideration. And if this does not change, the people will always look at them as a threat, as danger, um, and so on and so forth. Um, it, uh, and another point, I would like to mention here an NGO because uh, this NGO in, in Lampedusa, it's called Lampedusa Solidale, which uh, means um, uh, Lampedusa and solidarity with the migrants, um, is, is, been, is, 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 is been proposing many things, you know, for many years, um, even though nothing's been done in 20 years. But lately, this NGO has, uh, has, uh, um, uh, has, has put forward this manifesto of ideas. And I, I, will, I will say this and, and stop, but, but one of the ideas um, is that uh, to create air bridges and travel corridors for the immigrants, you know, so that they say they have safe corridors, safe mechanisms, um, so that they know which country can, can hospitalize them. So mind you, NGOs have been telling us this and telling the politicians this for a very, very long time. It has never been done. But now, after the lockdown, <laughs> uh, in, in, in June, in July, you know, all of a sudden, all our leaders have created safe corridors and the travel corridors so the tourists can travel safely um, uh, uh, where there is no COVID cases, so to say. So it could be done. And it, and it was done so very easily um, after a few months of, of, of lockdown. But after 20 years of discussing um, the immigrant situation, no, no corridors, no safe travel was ever opened um, to them. So I, I'll stop here for now about the immigration, but of course, you know, we can, we can continue <laughs> as long as you wish, I guess. <laughs> Um, a similar thing happened here with, the, with COVID. Um, the homeless situation has been getting steadily worse for the past decade since the Tories got in, basically, since these modern Tories got in. Um, and there was always a thing, well, you know, how are we going to solve the homeless problem? The first, the first spike of COVID, um, cities with big homeless, homeless population like Manchester, um, hotel rooms and hostels were open to them. So really the problem of homelessness was more or less solved in a week and this has been discussed for years and years and years how to solve it it can be solved these people can be helped now of course it's all gone back the other way and these people have been thrown back out onto the streets again but it shows that the solution is there but what happened was of course the homeless people became more than just an unpleasant sight of people going to go, go going to work or going to a restaurant or whatever and they became people that could actually physically threaten them with disease so it takes that, it takes that physical threat for people to actually do things, it, it, it seems to me. And there's only temporary measures anyway. But I mean, you know what, it, it does show that this can be done. These problems can be solved. But then greed and ideological narrowness come, always, always comes in. Well, um, I would add that... Um Really, when we look at the root of many of, of, of these issues, um, we are forced to admit that one of the problems has been that um, the West uh, wanted or thought it was right to impose certain political models on the rest of the world. And um, we are now, and, and the political model I'm talking about is democracy. Um, but democracy has failed us. Um, 
you know, democracy in the current environment um, has meant that mm. we have um, a, a very small majority um, of voices um, winning elections mm. that then uh, as a re uh, the, the, the consequence is that um, uh, minorities are not protected um, and this is really what any solid democracy is about to protecting minorities um, now the the refugees we are talking about let's not forget that um, the um, the large Moria camp on Lesbos, mm. the, the Greek island, which has a large number of refugees, was burned down to cinders, and these people are now homeless. So the, the problem really is that, and this is just looking at the refugee situation, that it has become a, you know, a, a, an, an issue that has been abused by politicians. Um, it makes Turkey, uh, it puts Turkey in a position where it, it can it can literally, you know, open the tap and let refugees um, travel to Europe. So, um, so it puts Turkey in a special position vis-a-vis -vis Europe. It's, um, and this is just one of the one of the issues we are talking about. In mm. Britain, we have right-wing politicians who have been using this issue again. People coming, trying to come here. Um, to, to reach safety. Um, so this has been used by right-wing politicians to draw attention away from the real problems, you know, the problems that uh, we are experiencing, problems of um, the government um, basically becoming, in, you know, incredibly corrupt, lying to the population and this is something that uh, we are supposed to forget because there's a couple of people, 10, 20, maybe 50, trying to reach our shores. And that has been blown up into a huge problem. And it's very useful for, for, for populists. Um, mm. Populists like, you know, the, and, and, and how it links with the class system in Britain as well. Rather than say, Oh, your problems are down to systematic degradation of your resources and environment from 10 years of Tory government and actually centuries of the class system. Your problems, it's that Polish plumber down lives down the road. It's his fault. He's taking he's taking your work away from you. It plays in to the whole to pop to the populist frenzy. Like just before the um, the EU referendum in 2016, big signs everywhere. 77 million Turks are about to are about to flee to Britain or flee, you know, about to invade. In, in the, the, the rhetoric was of invasion. I mean, what's the population of Turkey is, is even 77 million, you know. It was just nonsense, nonsense claims, grandiose, ridiculously egregious claims that were just put out there and uncontested and, and un unchallenged. And that's where so, no one's challenging it. Um, maybe coming back to the, or taking refuge in what we actually love in this kind of, um, crisis maybe we can come back to literature how do you think um, literature at this date uh, can reflect the truth of our societies our lives our possible struggles or our anxieties concerning future do you see a direct relationship or do you think literature is actually responding to this situation from your own point of view or from what you see in your own literary circles, that would be also very interesting for us and the audiences, I'm sure. I think the writer has the responsibility to tell the truth. The, the, the writers, you know, won't speak about numbers, but they create believable characters. So the writer is an accomplice, is a witness, is voicing the unvoiced, I would say. And I think many of us here, um, uh, in Malta, have uh, have written about uh, issues uh, of my of uh, migration, and and I think literature, um, because of uh, of uh, of of metaphors, of syntax, of juxtaposition, you know, of 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 new vocabulary, new literary uh, language, um, can 
can in involve the readers, can make the readers empathize and sympathize with, uh, with the characters that, uh, that they create. So in a way, um, I would say that, uh, that yes, that uh, um, literature is defining our society. Not, it, it's not necessarily mirroring you know, the society, but it's defining it in a sincere way, I would say, because the writers, unlike the politicians, um, are telling the truth. And um, politicians always have their own agenda, no? their own rhetoric as well to say, but, but the writers, and we need the writers and literature to tell the story of the other. I also think um, another thing, one thing is empathy, obviously. Um, another thing um, that literature off offers at this moment is a space to think is a space in which to um, articulate more nuanced problems. And I'm thinking especially, uh, where well, you mentioned politicians, yes, but I'm also thinking about, you know, the quality of, um, of the mass media, the, the, this, the mass media discourse, which is all about scandal, which is all about polarization, which is all about, you know, clickability or click bites or whatever. And uh, the social media, which you know can be useful as we know, but which can also be extremely destructive. And part of the destructiveness is of these of these languages. For example, in in the social media, is this really crude simplification of 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 problems? Yes, where you like something or you don't like something, or where you know people are ready to um, to pass judgments after five minutes of you know of whatever event it is that they comment and they feel entitled to comment yes mm -hmm. so i think um i think um as opposed to this i think literature um even though it's also part of the market which i think is a big problem because um uh, because um you know the book market also has its its its, its own limitations yes but still books proper books slow you down and offer a kind of space imaginative space symbolic space and offer the you know the kind of language that that allows one to slow down and to think so i like to think about literature as a place to think and to reflect and to formulate and, and articulate and to learn even how to how to think in more nuanced more subtle ways where where, where you know where it teaches you that there are many perspectives that you have to take into consideration yes that there are that every that that problems have I'm, I'm, I'm not saying you know a problem such as an obvious act of violence which is simple but but like social problems or or very are very often very complex so this kind of complexity i i think my my worry is that people have really the people's ability to understand any kind of complexity ecological complexity for instance you know the complexity of life but also the complexity of social life that this has really decreased you know that everything is just kind of like very flat and shallow and so here this what i think the power of literature is in saving our capacity to to understand complexity of of, of any kind yes yes i totally totally agree i've always thought writing novels especially is um is the practice of telling permanent truths through temporary lies. You know, you invent characters, you, 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 you make things up. Um, but in doing that, you tell, you tell the permanent truth of what, it's, of what it's like to be one person at one time. That, 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 and that person in themselves and in all their wonderful complexities um, can be just totally reduced and swallowed up as a statistic in vast historical movements, the ones that, the, the ones that we're going through now. In doing that as well, I think you resurrect the language in this in a world of sound bites and clickbait, and, and in a world of lies, really, you know, um, that truth telling of the of the beauty and complexity and faults mm -hmm. of, a, of 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 a human being is 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 vital. It's, it's crucial that we need to hold on. And as as Julia alluded to there, um, there's a calmness in this. This got nothing to do with comfort. It is uncomfortable to do this. But there's a vast calmness in this. I've always imagined it, that's what it'd be like to find a god, really. You'd feel an immense pe calm, but no comfort. You're, you're, you're addressing yourself all the time. You're looking at yourself. You're addressing your shortcomings. You're looking at your faults all the time to grow and grow. And this never stops, of course, until the day you die. 
Um, so yes, I mean my my, my you know my armchair behind me. It can look so cosy to the outside. I'm sitting in my arms, I've got my cat on my knee, a cup of tea, I'm reading, blanket on my knee, it looks very cosy. But actually there's a welter of emotions going on inside, a whirlwind. And I wouldn't have it any other way. And um, hopefully I'm communicating that, that re reanimation, that re re reinvigoration of the, the human capacity to feel in a, in a world gone largely numb. But I would ask, are the books, um, are the books uh, we are talking about, uh, is, is literature reaching the people uh, who uh, we would like to see maybe, you know, stop and um, contemplate complexity <laughs> or um, contemplate the, the 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 ways in which language has been has been literally corrupted and debased um, by the media. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't know. I think that's an interesting point. Um, with the especially in, in Britain at the moment, the, the denigration of the so-called liberal metropolitan elite. You know, the thinker. You know. The denigration of that is is really the it's really the it's the modern day equivalent of Nazis burning pile, burning piles of books, you know, and they're not worth looking at. They you know because I mean what when authoritarian systems, what's the first person they go for? The in, the intellectual, the writer, um, you know, Pol mm. Pot. Pol Pot was so fearful of intellectuals that he killed everybody who wore glasses. That would be nearly every every one of us here. It's it, it seems to me. Um, but then at the same time, I think it's also um, incumbent upon writers um, to show that actually we're not, write, we're not writing for a rarefied audience. You know, um, I mean, for me, this is part of my upbringing, you know, there's, there's never any books in the house. So I always had to take books to sneak away. If I was caught reading them, I'd be beaten up, you know, not by my family, but by, but by people in the school. Um, so it was always a contraband practice for me. But it's always been something that doesn't really come from the come from the brain. It's not an intellectual pursuit, it's an emotional pursuit to write and read. You know, it comes from the lungs and the blood and the gonads and the and the, the skin, as well as the brain, it seems to me. So I think it comes upon writers to do that um, and to try and communicate that, it seems. That said, um, I'm always pleased when I, do, when I do readings, if those days ever come back again when I do public readings. And the mixture of the in the audience that I have, I have, I have people who want to talk to me about the influence of um, Beowulf, and I have people who want to talk to me about what it's like to stop taking heroin, you know, um, and what it's like to, to to pawn everything in your family in your house because you're so poor, you know. So I quite like the fact that I I can reach um, these 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 different sections of society, but I do think writers themselves need to do more of this. The media doesn't always help. You know, um, working class writing is often seen as something n nice to have around, but it can't really speak important truths, you know, which is why, which is why we get historical novels that, 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 that are so popular these days, because the writers don't really know how to deal with the modern world. So they'll retreat to a time before we had the internet, let's say. It's a big job to do, but I think we have to do it. Mm -hmm. I don't want to sound very pessimistic here, but I think our politicians are surrounded by intellectuals now and, and writers who may have been co-opted in the propaganda uh, mechanisms now. I mean, and they are selling their image to the public, after all. Um, so, so quite our literature is reaching them, but uh, when, but our, our politics, and this is why democracy has failed us as well, um, have, have nothing to do um, with, with the people, you know, they're not there to, to give service to the people, they're there to give service to the businessmen because they are entangled so much um, with, with the businessmen since they um, help them win the election. So, and, and that is why even, you know, it, it becomes even more corrupt and they just... Uh, so. Yeah, I said I don't want to sound pessimistic, but uh, maybe they do know what's been written, but they they just don't care, you know. If 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 they if they are ready to kill um, a journalist, um, yes, just yes. because she was you know digging too much, <laughs> just because she was uh, um, 
uh, telling everyone that uh, our government is in business, it has shady contracts and, and has banks in Panama and um, et cetera, et cetera. And then, you know, the journalist is blown yeah, up. Yeah, actually, yeah, actually in, in Malta, you are seeing the literal deaths of writers, yeah. <laughs> it's shocking, no, it's, uh, yeah. it's shocking and sad. And, uh, and that's why the, the two, two, two months, we've been on the streets for two months, whole November and whole December to, to, to cry for justice and transparency. Mm -hmm. But the, the problem is that our politicians are surrounded by their people or, or and many, and, and I'm sure even in other countries, you know, they, they, they choose the right people for the very top jobs, mm -hmm. including um, the police, the, the, the court, the public broadcasting. So, so then it's difficult, it's difficult um, to, to, to 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 have an alternative narrative, you know, because their narrative, their story is out here and everywhere and um, through many channels. They have their people in every nook and cranny um, and se selling their image. <laughs> Certainly too, and, and, and like a like a vulture sense in carrion, these people can send can sense corruptibility, you know. Exactly. So we so we have to remain incorruptible. And um, I know what you mean, but I mean, our, our, our own leaders in Britain, yeah, they, they've got writers around them, but they're journalists, they're, they're tame journalists, or they're the modern equivalent of semantic core poets, you know. Those of us who will resolutely remain outside of that inner circle, that sacrum, mm -hmm. or the anti-sacrum rather, and we have to keep doing it, but we, but we have to, my point is that we have to keep pressing more and more and more. I don't really know how we do it, although, you know, there's many ways. Press more and more and more the, the way that we are not these rarefied ivory tower dwellers. Yeah. Mm. Translation is, is de sorry, Julia, you go. Translation is definitely um, an important, no? And it's very relevant now for, for, the, yeah. for our yeah. future. Yeah. It, but first, it first has to reach us because, um, what, well, we, we, we have discussed this many, many times, Alexandra, right? I mean, we here organize a translation workshop every year and then a, f a small festival, literature festival, um, and we get writers to, to translate each other's work. But most of the times what's happening is that all that literature is just being translated um, in, in, into, sorry, that one, English is just being translated into the small literatures, but the small literatures um, are not being translated into the many. Mm -hmm. And so they are not reaching us. And, and that's why we need more um, workshops. And yeah, yeah. So, you know, we, we get to know what's happening in Turkey. We, I, I, I don't know what the writers in Turkey are, are writing. I mean, okay, the most popular ones, yes. They've made it, but there are so many others who are writing um, beautiful things, and the, this can never reach us. Yes, but some some small presses are trying. See, I mean, I'm I'm re re reviewing three books at the moment: one translated from the Czech, one translated from the Estonian, one translated from the Irish. But these are all by Parthian. So some small presses are trying, because the larger presses, well, as you mentioned before, it's about big business, isn't it? It's about it's about corporate profits the small presses are less interesting well they less need that to survive you know it's not it's not their life but their life is circulation it seems to me but um, I would say that uh, what you what you just said Claire is um, Kurdish Kurdish writing in in Turkey is a case in point we really do not know what's going on on that scene and uh, years ago, we organized a conference which actually focused on uh, Kurdish writing in Turkey, but we also tried to um, position it in relation to other countries which have um, uh, populations which speak a language which is described as a minority language, but who can't describe a language as a minority language when it's spoken by, um, uh, you know, by millions of people so it's really about support um it's about uh, financial support it's about um censorship it's about uh, power structures in in culture 
it's it's about a lot of things that are barriers a lot of barriers that stand in the way of uh, more of a flow um, of literature into other languages at that conference I remember I was really surprised by the, 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 the richness of the Kurdish literary scene by the number of publishing houses by the number of writers by the fact that there are translations into Kurdish um, of classics, European classics or contemporary works, uh, magazines, theater, all that. Um, and we absolutely know nothing about it. Mm. Um, I, I don't think there has been really a, a Kurdish language author who has been translated into, into English. Um, there are authors from the other parts of the region who write in the other dialects of, of, of Kurdish. Um, there was the very first novel that was uh, written by um, a, a Kurdish writer from Iraq called Bakhtiar Ali. And that novel, which is an amazing, amazing work of art, was for the first time translated into English, a first, a first work of literature translated into English from that language, from Sarani. So it's really, and it is, it is partly because there is no, no support for the, you know, for, for this to happen. You, Niall, have, have named actually three languages that have very generous support in terms of promoting their literature and, and oh, translations. So, um, you know, that's something we need to look at. We always yeah. need to look at the... Could you, you send me the details of, of a Kurdish novel you just mentioned? Hmm? Could you send me the details of the Kurdish novel you just yeah, mentioned? Yeah, of course. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Julia, yeah. you add something I think before we move on our closing question oh uh, I don't I don't think I, I'm not sure how interesting this is what I'm, what I'm going to say because I think that the specific the political specificity of our countries can also be uh, uh, quite diff quite different yes and so and therefore also the you know the the, the meaning um, of of this political intervention that literature does or of of you know where and how it is important may also may also vary. It seems to me, right? Because, for example, in Poland, I don't feel like uh, I don't feel like you know I'm risking anything by writing whatever it is that I that I that I want to write. So my situation is obviously a lot more comfortable and easier than than in some other countries. But there was just one thing that I wanted to say, and that is that you know paradoxically in Poland, uh, it is the populist conservative government which understands the importance of culture. And they give a lot of money to culture. It's just that, you know, it's hard for people, for example, like myself to use this money, yes, because I'm opposed to their politics. But, um, but I think it has, I think, I think this is interesting because it's the previous neoliberal government that destroyed culture, that completely underfunded culture. They didn't care. So that, like, it was like, okay, you have to sell and that's also a kind of this isn't freedom i mean when you when you when you when the only when the only um uh, criterion is that you have to sell the only mm -hmm. criterion is that you know literature is what 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 the market decides uh it wants to buy then you end up you know mm -hmm. having to respond to a kind of consumerist demands yes so this is also a kind of, well, I don't want to use the word such as a betrayal, yes, but this is also, I think, a problem that, 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 that there is a lot of um, work produced, which is produced in, resp in response to this kind of uh, uh, consumerist demand. And now, and now we have this, this conservative government and they understand, you know, that they are not going to have uh, a nation. Yeah, it's not my word, but it's their, their word for the, community yes if we don't have culture and so it's very clear to them that they have and they give a lot they really they fund things they give a lot of a lot of money to people that you know they think are are uh, creating interesting polish culture yes so uh so uh, um so i think it's it's, it's complicated not just in, in relation to politics but also in relation to to capitalism mm. How are they with writers like um, 
Stashuk and Dorota Was Waswowska, who it seems to me are questioning the, the whole Polish. Um, I mean, most of us are. Most of us are qu questioning. You know, I don't think Stashuk or Maswowska need a lot of support from yeah. the state because yeah. they are very popular, they are very famous writers. But I also, like, there's a Polish book institute which, uh, which um, funds translations. If a foreign publisher wants to publish a Polish book, they can usually apply for a translation grant. You know, and everybody has got these grants. Stasiuk has got these grants and, and Olga Tokarczuk before the Nobel Prize. Now, obviously, she doesn't need any, yeah, any grants, yeah. but before she got the Nobel Prize, even though she was, you know, considered as this leftist, uh, she, she would get these, these translation grants as well. So, so um, of course, they would try to, you know, smuggle in their own Catholic conservative yeah, yeah. Uh, but but I, like I, I I got funding also for or my 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 books also got got funding uh, to be translated into into Ukrainian recently. So so uh, I, you know I'm not I'm not saying it's the situation is good. I'm just saying that it I think it's a really big paradox that um, that they seem to understand the, the 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 role of culture more, even though they are of course destroying a lot of. Uh, you know, great cultural institutions, uh, but they do this because they have their own vision of what Polish culture should do. Yes. yes? But they have definitely more respect for the power of culture than the previous government. Yes, that is that is the twisted paradox. Mm -hmm. I mean, here with the here with the with the whole Brexit thing, you know, we're promoting British culture. Well, what 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 la what what layer of British culture? You know, there's so many. There's Welsh language culture. There's Scottish language culture. There's so there's so many different layers of culture, but they have a very very ankle shallow idea, a cartoon flag waving idea of what British culture is. Well, I would say I can't see this as as paradox. What you just said, Julia, I'm I'm older than all of you, and I grew up in Central Europe when. Uh, we literally had official culture, which was supported with loads of money, and we had state publishing. Mm. But the whole publishing sector was owned by the state, and books came out, books that were deemed appropriate, mm. uh, were actually published in print runs of a hundred thousand in a country of, um, I mean, at that time, it was a country composed of two parts, so it was about 15 million people, but still, it's, um, it, it, it was incredible, and people loved to read. They loved to read, and they, they, um, th there was this phenomenon, which I sometimes remember, you know, um, that books always came out, uh, every, everything was, um, was kind of planned and, um, you know, coordinated, so, um, which of course is possible, you know, when, when the state is at the helm of it, and um, so books came out every Thursday, and there were long queues when a really interesting book was coming out and people knew that it was being it was being released that particular Thursday. So people would queue, stand in a line in front of bookshops from five o'clock in the morning. And, uh, you, you know, it, it, it was a peculiar situation because there were amazing books being published. There was a lot of uh, translation from a, a range of different languages done beautifully by people who couldn't travel <laughs> to, to practice the language. And um, so, so it, was a, it was a bizarre situation, but I, I, you know, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't describe what you're saying, Julia, as a paradox. It actually is a repeat of a situation, maybe in a more nuanced manner. So for our last uh, closing question, maybe we can follow up from what we have discussed so far and uh, consider the situation across maybe not only in literature but all arts, how the language of art has been politicized uh, inevitably as we are just talking at the moment and uh, at the other, at, on the other hand how it can produce a new vocabulary maybe or new strategies to actually combat the situations we have been 
um, stepping on. Uh, what do you think on this um, matter? Do you find hope in in literature or the future of a speech uh, in in various ways? Uh, do you think it can provide us with alternatives, um, an alternative way of communication, uh, and how how we can turn this strategy into survival, both on the level of literary production but also on the level of maybe um communication well it's going to be interesting now um, there's a thing there's a festival scheduled for 2022 it was called a festival of brexit but because that is still divisive and rancorous it's now going to be called a, fe a festival of britain so um there's a lot of organ there's a lot of government bump being put out to send us ideas about to sell how to celebrate Britain. It'll be interesting who signs up for that. I want nothing to do with it personally. Um, I'm gonna, I want nothing to do with any country that's, dis that's descended into this vile, rancid nationalism. I want nothing to do with it. But it'll be interesting to see um, which arts organisations do. I wish I could be more subjective about this, but I can't. I'm in the thick of it. So that's going to be very interesting. Um, and I think we're a bit too soon Rather like somebody said, um, you know, in the 60s, what do you think about the French Revolution? They said it's, it's too early It's too early to say, you know, from 1798s or, or, or whenever it was. Um, we've had quite a glut of, of, of Brexit novels coming out now, but um, they tend to be quite um, middle class, it seems to me. Um, and certain levels of society are being forgotten, as they always are. So I think it's more imperative um, that there are more and more voices paid attention to, especially, you know, we have a good thing now, the, um, um, I think it's like, the, I think it's called the Unforgotten Voices of Immigrants, basically. And the, there's lots of anthologies about um, stories written by, written by immigrants from all over the world. It, this is such a valuable thing to do. Um, and I really like, I really like to see this. In terms of hope, well, um, you know, I kind of bring things down to the micro level really is that, you know, there's, if we see some scales, you know, on, on this level, on this, on this plate is corruption, nationalism, xenophobia, everything bad. And on this level is sympathy, pity, fellow feeling, you know, at the moment they're like this. So the more we can put in little tiny bits of weight onto this scale, no matter how tiny, the more we can balance it out. So I think you have to see this as, see this as a moment for, self-reflection self-introspection and self-expression definitely you know i think that's the only hope there is at the moment to be honest with you um it's too early to tell but we have to try the um alternative is to is is to surrender you know i mean that's one thing you know that the we keep saying now, you know, Britain needs to compromise. You know, the two warring tribes need to compromise. Except the tribe who won, in inverted commas, you know, we've all lost, really. But the tribe who won don't want compromise. They want capitulation. And people like me and all my friends and everybody aren't going to capitulate, you know. So, as I say, I can be a little bit objective about it and try to be objective, although it's so difficult to do. It's, we're in for interesting times in art and politics and everything else. Horrible times too, but let's go with interesting. Um, I would say I find it problematic to talk about politicization or polit politicized literature. Um, in the old days, I referred to um, just now, uh, we used uh, the term tendentious, 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 which was which meant biased or partisan. Mm -hmm. And it was used about uh, works of literature or art, which placed politics above everything else, which basically tried to indoctr or indoctrinate. Um, I think every action is, is, is political. Every work can be seen in a political um, context, mm. even, even not making a political statement and upholding that as, a, as virtue is actually political. I know itself. writers who will say, I am the, uh, you know, I am a citizen of the, of the Republic of Letters. 
I think this is nonsense. I don't want to vomit, yes. yes. It really means that you don't want to, you don't want to, um, you know, make two sides angry. So you're pretending to yeah. you're basically sitting on the face uh, on the fence. So, so I think ev every every action is political. Every action in our daily life is political. Yes, totally agree. Anyone else? <laughs> on politicized literature? Or the future of hope? Yeah, okay. <laughs> few, few more, few, few, few last words. I mean, I agree with, with you totally, um, Alexandra. Um, uh, even writing, just writing about women is political for me. So, you know, it's... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and I totally agree with Niall. I mean, uh, I'm sure that uh, um, um, literature will not change the... The world, no, it, it won't change the corrupt politicians and make them uncorrupt. But uh, but there is hope, and we cannot surrender, and it can touch lives, I think. And uh, and I go back to translation because I believe translation is the key. Um, because um, e e even even to to change our vocabulary, you know, and tra translation. When you translate, you immerse yourself in the words of someone else. And this is the way I believe that that my writing can change the the rhythm of the rhythms of my literature, the vocabulary, the the the, the syntax also. So, mm -hmm. so yes, I will stop here. Translation is the key, and as Umberto Eco once said, the translation is the new language of uh, the European Union. So, of, yeah. of Europe, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Great quote. Sorry, sorry, Alexandra, of your rip. Yeah, um, it's, it's interesting how the so-called small languages, even if they may be spoken by a number of people, are in many ways modest in this sense because they acknowledge that receiving literature from uh, receiving works of literature from other cultures actually contributes to uh, the development of their own, of, 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 of their yeah, language and, and so on. And this is something that, uh, that English speaking countries still haven't really come to terms with or haven't, haven't yeah. really grappled with properly. Yeah. 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 yeah, you would like to say something maybe? Um, I just wanted to say that even writing about non-human nature or even writing about the environment is political. And it uh, nowadays because um, because ecology cannot be separated from economy or politics or social issues, and so um, and so in terms of um, you know the, the the literature and politics, I think we also need to redefine politics, redefine what what counts as 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 political and important. And I also agree with Alexandra that there are many ways of being political and being and sort of and propaganda is the least interesting of of, mm. of those yeah. ways yes yeah. or or making clear clear like like sort of you know pronouncements and judgments is is mm. the least interesting of of the least interesting kinds of of, of political to me mm. um. thank you uh, once again for your valuable contribution to the Arbuckle Comparative Literature Days 2020 edition, online edition. It was very interesting for us, uh, for me to listen to all this significant insight coming from different countries and from your own literary world. I'm sure it will inspire many new thoughts in, in our listeners as well. Um, I hope, I know uh, that we will meet again uh and and thanks a lot to uh, alexandra in person and literature across frontiers for co-organizing this this session um and i hope everyone will stay safe <laughs> thank you of go and thank you everyone thank you for accepting this invitation and thank you for the for the fascinating discussion and and sorry sorry to you know keep coming up with brexit we're still traumatized four years later yeah <laughs> thank you
Thank you.